Hey everybody, welcome back to Bayesian. So we, um, I want to spend one more lecture on um, generalized linear models. In this case, I want to move on to what I'm calling special GLMs, which are just, uh, I think, uh, more complex than either uh, Poisson or Bernoulli. In fact, they're a combination of the two. So it's kind of a feel natural for us to talk about these particular uh, models. There are two types of models I will not be covering um, with, a, with a video lecture, and that's a binomial and a multinomial. The notes are there and the code is there. They're just not that different from uh, a Bernoulli. Um, it, it, you know, please read through that material uh, on your own. Uh, let me know if you have questions. It's just, if I cover it in a video lecture, it will just get too repetitive because it's not substantively different the binomial and the multinomial from the Bernoulli. In fact, the Bernoulli is a special case of both of those. So today I would like to talk about regression uh, models for count data, what I'm calling mysterious count. And these are a class of models uh, that are known as zero inflated models. So in general, we turn to zero inflated models when we have count data with many zeros. What, how many is many? Well, we don't know, but how we get to um, a count data with many zeros, it could be a binary process where someone miscoded a few threes and fours. Um, it just could be that you're running into detection limits, or it could be that some individuals in your data set are simply incapable of experiencing the outcome. You know, thinking of COVID, someone could have the genetic makeup to be immune to COVID. Um, how many of those people are there? I don't know, but it is plausible that those folks exist. There are a lot of examples of where this data occurs. So I, I found three that are interesting and also from different fields. Here's a pain intensity example on the left. We see that most people reported having no pain at all. And then we have the next sort of mode is around, I don't know, three or four, a rating of about three or four. And then far fewer people report a pain of one or a pain of 10. This is an interesting one from, I imagine, horticulture. Uh, the number of roots has a big old spike at zero. And then uh, maybe you know a mode right around this value over here. Um, oddly enough, there is a ton of research on zero inflated models from dental caries, which is just tooth decay. Um, I think, from my understanding, it's a, a fairly big issue in developing in the developing world. Uh, you know, when folks don't have access to clean water, uh, worrying about tooth decay is a bit secondary. But this histogram actually is too zero inflated. That's when you have more zeros than you are expecting under a particular model. But of course, you know, is this how zero inflated is this on the right? It is certainly not as zero inflated as the other two examples. So to investigate sort of, can we, how can we tell, how can we detect zero inflation? Well, we can certainly fit a couple of models. We can fit, uh, a formally zero inflated model and its cousin that is not zero inflated. And you can compare something like the WAIC or perform a posterior predict, uh, uh, predictive check. But what if you don't want to fit models? Uh, you have to wait for the model to converge. You have to make sure in a Bayesian world to specify your priors correctly. In a frequentist world, you have to find a package that fits zero inflated models. You have to make a lot of decisions. So I decided um, using uh, an R package to generate data from four different um, count distributions with the same mean. This is key. The only thing that is changing in those four panels is the distribution I'm using. The mean remains the same. So Poisson with a mean of four, negative binomial with a mean of four. Remember, a negative binomial allows for the variance to be greater than the mean. The Poisson assumes the variance is identical to the mean. So Poisson is a special case of a negative binomial. But we're talking about zeros. So in terms of zeros, 
you will notice that the negative binomial with the same mean tends to produce more zeros. So in the literature, what you will see, um, sometimes people solve the a lot of zeros problem by fitting a negative binomial versus a Poisson. Poisson is just not a very good count regression model. Negative binomial is far more flexible than that. It has to do with the zeros, has to do with the variance and the mean, etc. Here I generated a mean of four, but only with a mild zero inflation case. Here I have more zero inflation. And again, zero inflation is having more zeros than expected under a particular model. And what I'm seeing is there is a kind of a non-smooth transition from a zero to a one. And you will see that it's fairly extreme here and here and fairly mild here. But all three have evidence of zero inflation. So I think the, the left and the middle panel are more like my, um, you know, a lot of zero inflation case. And the rightmost panel is more like my mild zero inflation case. So technically, any integer, any outcome can be inflated. Um, and zeros are of particular interest because of the interpretation. Um, in medicine, oftentimes you, 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 know, you have um, sort of folks who are immune or um, if, an even more interesting interpretation. For example, if you are applying a zero inflated model to ER, emergency room visits, but people without any emergency room visits could, for example, lack the necessary medical coverage or just simply be super lucky to not need an emergency uh, uh, department visit. Now, any distribution, not just the Poisson and the negative binomial, can be inflated. We can have uh, a, a zero inflated binomial so that's when you have you know, y over n. You have some number of successes over some number of trials. And you can have more zeros than what is expected under a binomial. Zero inflated negative binomial is when you have more zeros than can be expected under a negative binomial. And a, a really special case that I would like to explore actually in our activity on Tuesday is a zero one inflated beta. Just as a preview, you know, a beta is used to model proportions. Propor, well, I can't spell. Proportions. But without n. So all you observe is a proportion between zero and one, but you, unlike in the case of a binomial, you don't observe n. The beta distribution is commonly used to model proportions without n, but the beta distribution is not defined for either zero exactly or one exactly. But what if you have, what if you have data with a bunch of zeros, a bunch of ones, and then something in between? So you can have a zero, one inflated beta. That's a preview for, for next Tuesday. Today, I'm still very much going to focus on uh, more zeros in a count data example. All right, so this is a figure out of our uh, wonderful book. Um, and so it, the next few slides will present kind of a flow chart for how a zero comes to be. So we start right there. And the first decision that the model performs, this is uh, what the model does. The model decides whether um, the zero belongs to the immune class, sometimes it's called a structural zero, or the at risk class, or what I'm calling a, a random zero. There is a lot of different names or nomenclature for these things. Um, these are probably the most intuitive. Now, why do we call this a structural zero? Well, because once we are assigned to that structural zero, once we are deemed as being immune, then there is nothing random left about our outcome. Once we are immune, we must produce a zero. 
once an observation is deemed to be part of this immune class, and by the way, this classification is not observed, not recorded. We don't have data to say whether someone is immune or at risk. So this is not recorded, not observed. We infer that an observation belongs to either the immune class or the at-risk class using a set of covariates, but we don't record that as its own binary variable. So once we deem that a, an observation is um, a structural zero, belongs to the immune class, there is nothing random, we must observe a zero. And we do that with probability P. So I think these are some of the notes I have on the bottom of this slide. The first thing that the model decides with probability P assigns a observation to the uh, immune class with probability one minus P assigns an observation to the at-risk class. Very much the, the quotations I needed here because I am not claiming someone is actually for sure immune from a disease. I don't have enough medical training to know um, how um, commonplace or, or uh, plausible it is to be completely and truly immune from a disease. But remember, when we're, when we're building models, we're really asking the questions, um, there, we're claiming when we're fitting a zero inflated model that there are two sources for the zeros. Some that are always zero and some that are on the next slide. All right, and some that are at risk. So. If we are assigned with probability one minus P to this at-risk class, what I'm calling a random zero, I can still observe a zero. I can be at risk, but just not experience an event within our time frame. You think back to the uh, Poisson regression with an offset. You record how many cases, uh, you know, are of COVID are observed in a given time frame. Uh, for a particularly small county, there could be no cases observed, even though very much so the population inside that county is at risk. Or somebody at risk can, of course, observe a count like a one, two, three, four. Most often that I've seen out there, this count portion, either you know zero or something greater than zero, is modeled using a Poisson. Remember that Poisson can definitely produce a zero. But there is no reason why when we are assigned to this at-risk class, we can't be a negative binomial, a binomial, a beta, a gamma, etc. So let's just build our intuition about this flow chart. Remember, the first assignment is probabilistic. It's kind of like you think, hey, this is a Bernoulli. And then only for the at-risk class, we go into a count regression. There is nothing happening on this side of the flow chart that is random. Once you are assigned to the immune class, you are always a zero no matter what. So what is the probability then for, uh, of us observing a zero count? Let's assume that this count portion is a Poisson. And if that count portion is a Poisson, then here is the distribution of a Poisson. It's the classic old distribution. That's Y factorial on the bottom. Lambda, uh, it's a Poisson with a mean lambda. Here is lambda to the Y. 
e to the negative lambda, and that's a y factorial on the bottom. This is happening inside this at-risk class. So the way we get a zero is we are either immune or we are at risk and produce a zero. This is basically a combination of these two pathways. In statistics, or is an addition. Thinking back to your intro to stat probabilities. At risk and zero. So probability that we're immune is P. All right, that was easy enough. Then we are assigned to the immune, uh, I'm sorry, at risk class with probability one minus P. And we produce a zero by plugging y equals zero into this formula up here. So if I plug in y equals zero into this formula up here, I get lambda to the zero, e to the negative lambda. And a little trick is that uh, uh, zero factorial is zero, is one, excuse me. Zero factorial is one, e to the zero is one. So the probability that we observe a zero, probability that we're immune is P, probability that we're at risk one minus P and, and is multiplication. Our count is equal to zero according to a Poisson E to the negative lambda. What about uh, the probability of observing a count that is not zero? It is impossible that our count is not zero everywhere I just crossed out. So we are assigned to the at-risk class with probability one minus P and then I'll write, it, I'll write it in the same order. Lambda to the y, e to the negative lambda, y factorial. And we are, for example, equal to one. So you would do lambda to the one, e to the negative lambda. Lambda is the mean of the Poisson, right? Over one factorial. All right, that's the probability that we observe y equals to one. What's the probability we observe y equals to two? Well, we, it's still for us impossible to be in, in all of the little flow, uh, in the flow chart that I've crossed out. So y equals to two, all right. Cross out this guy, cross out this guy. So notice that any non-zero count only occurs in this at-risk portion of the diagram. So in general, put this whole thing on ice, as I, as I like to say, our expected or mean count, if we work it out, and I'm not going to make you do it, is lambda, which is the mean of the at-risk portion, times one minus P, P being the probability that we belong in the immune class. The variance is kind of an ugly formula that I thought about writing down. And, and if I'm not gonna make you derive it, I don't want you to memorize it, but know that it is bigger than the mean. And so zero inflated models are also over dispersed. Remember as a review, the negative binomial models are over dispersed relative to the Poisson. There are a set of cases that are under dispersed. Under dispersed is when the variance is smaller, smaller than the mean. And so neither the negative binomial nor none of the uh, zero inflated models can help a case that is under dispersed. We often come with covariance 
And so we assign covariates to the logit of P like a Bernoulli. And then if we are in the at-risk class, the count we observe once we're deemed to be at risk, hey, look, this is just like a Poisson or a negative binomial, if you like that more. This is just like a Poisson. It just applies to the individuals in the at risk class. A quick side note, because um, I've seen some confusion between hurdle models and zero inflated models. We're going to be talking about zero inflated models because hurdle models just cut off this particular uh, branch. So hurdle models say that all zeros come from one process and all non-zeros come from a different process. Zero inflated models have two processes for a zero. I like... Uh, I, I personally don't like making the decision that I know that much about zeros that um, an individual that is deemed at risk cannot ever produce a zero. So that's why I prefer zero inflated models that are more uh, flexible. Even at risk individuals can still produce a zero. But if you see hurdle models in the literature, there's nothing that crazy about them. You assign individual to the immune class of probability P they always produce a zero. And now you assign uh, individuals in the at-risk class for probability one minus P, but now they produce one, two, three, four, never a zero, okay? And yes, you can estimate both in the BRMS package. All right, let's look at an example. And this is one of my sort of favorite um, applications of a, of a fairly complex model. By the way, this is like a mixture of a Bernoulli and a Poisson. Like it's a mixture of a binary and a count distribution, which then makes this natural as the third lecture of this series. We talked about count data, last time talked about Bernoulli. Now we're gonna combine them together and make them work together. So some real data. Uh, originally uh, submitted to Psychology Today, which is not a peer-reviewed journal, but the, there has been a peer-reviewed article on these data. And they asked participants to report how many extramarital affairs uh, they committed in the last conducted, acquired, ascertained, uh, procured in the last 12 months. So notice, no need to offset. All of the rows we're giving our participants 12 months to either report having an affair or not having an affair. This is the reason that our models will not have an offset term in them. If this was not the case, and we followed individuals for a different number of months, we would need to include the number of time, uh, of time uh, number of time, the amount of time we followed each individual as an offset term. But here, all the data covered 12 months for all individuals. We have a few covariates, gender, presence of kids. Kids is not the number of kids. Kids is yes, they have kids, no, they don't have kids the age of the participant in the survey, years married to their current partner. They asked the participants how religious they were on the scale that is interesting because one is anti-religion and then we jumped to not at all, all the way to very religious. And they asked the participants to rate their marriage as being um, how happy they are with their marriage, either very unhappy all the way to very happy. In general, Keep in mind as we go through these data that they're real, but also they are submitted to uh, via a mail-in survey. So think about response rates to a mail-in survey. Think about who would feel comfortable 
um, you know, revealing something like this in a mail-in survey in 1969, 1970, although maybe that's the, you know, free love, whatever decade. I wasn't alive, put it that way. And also, I have a lot of questions about this religiosity rating. Um, I am not a psychometric or measurement expert, but it seems like being anti-religious is not quite on the same scale as being not at all, not very, slash very religious. However, I am happy personally with the uh, marriage rating scale, being very unhappy, somewhat unhappy, et cetera, until we get to very happy, would seem like it probably works in uh, measuring how happy you are with your marriage. So all of those caveats aside, let's take a quick peek at the data. And I will again, reveal my thoughts about this. Um, we got, I think, 600 and, well, let's flip to R. Uh, by the way, it comes to us from uh, a art library called Woldridge, which is a companion package to a textbook. Uh, it's actually an econometrics textbook, but I found some very interesting data there. Um, we got responses from 601 people. And the vast majority of these people, and in fact, um, 451, 451 out of 601, which is 75%, did not report having a single affair in the last 12 months. There were a few people who reported having one affair, a few people reported having two affairs. And then something interesting happens because I'm having a tough time believing that in a sample this large, no one's gonna um, tell us that they're having, now there could, could have been a few people who have had three affairs, but there's a clear case of people sort of guesstimating. Here's my hypothesis, and, and uh, this is going on video. So my, my friends and I have this hypothesis rating scale where the number of beers, so this is, a, I have a, a three, not even a three, I think a two beer hypothesis. I have to have two beers, my friends have to have two beers in order to believe my hypothesis. The, my two beer hypothesis is that people just guesstimate. They have a uh, mistress or a mister somewhere and they're like, oh, I see them about once uh, every couple of months. I'm gonna guess uh, seven or six times. And then uh, this clumping is I have a regular mister or mistress, by the way, these are men and women in this uh, survey. I see them pretty regularly. So about once a month. So I will go ahead and report having 12, 12 affairs in the last 12 months. So I, I have a tough time believing that these data are entirely accurate. In fact, we look at the possible outcomes we only have six possible counts, a zero, a one, a two, and a three, but only 19 people reported having three affairs and 17 people reported having two affairs. Then we have seven, which is an interesting number, and 12 in the last 12 months. No one reported having more than one affair per month on average. Now, even more so, what defines an extramarital affair not only has probably evolved over time, but perhaps changes from one couple to the other. I, I am not about to judge any single person on earth, but um, one must think that this survey said, uh, made certain requirements about what had to take place in order for it to count as an extramarital affair. Let's keep it, let's, let's leave it there. Clearly, there's a lot of zeros. Clearly, if you use sort of my super simple heuristic of looking for those non-smooth transitions, yeah, this is there, there is some zero inflation here. All right, moving right along. The first set of models that I would like to run, I'm gonna include all of my covariates in my sort of count portion in my at risk portion of that diagram, but I will not be including any covariates in my um, 
zero inflation or immune portion of the model. And then for comparison, I'm going to run a good old Poisson just to compare um, what, what I would get. So priors. As you might imagine, it is relatively difficult to set priors when we, are, when we cannot observe how many of these zeros, how many of these zeros are folks who generally frown on having extramarital affairs, and how many of those zeros were perhaps busy that year uh, and, and uh, just couldn't get around to getting an affair into their schedule. So, and that's really what our model tries to do. It tries to separate these two, the, these zeros into two sources of zeros. Some folks who are immune from having an extramarital affair and those folks who are at risk for having an extramarital affair. Let me flip back and I'll run through a prior predictive simulation for a zero inflated model. You guys have seen a lot of this code before. Um, I'm going to, here's my inverse logit function that takes uh, and makes a probability, something that um, is bounded between zero and one. And I have in my model, um, I actually have a covariate. Um, so it's a little bit more complex than what I have on this screen, but not too, too much more complex. I just include age into the probability of being immune from having an affair. So I thought age was a pretty simple case. I have a set of priors that are clearly too wide and I have a priors that I feel are about right. So first things first, gamma zero. It's sort of the average proportion of zeros in my data set. Now I know I'm gonna try and split those zeros into two sources, but I'm setting priors. I don't have information on something I literally do not observe. I don't, I don't have the, uh, character makeup of these people. I don't have their character witness statements. I have no idea. The only information I have is from the fact that 75% of my observations are exactly zero. And if I center my normal at a 1.1, which is logit of 0.75, log of 0.75 divided by one minus 0.75, all right, so I just rounded this to 1.1. That is why I am centering this prior at 1.1. I am picking a standard deviation that is clearly too wide. If you recall our Bernoulli lecture, frankly, three and two and a half are probably too, too wide. So here, I'm just demonstrating what it would look, look like if we went too wide. I will use a centered and scaled age in the, in the logit portion of the program here. So I will center this prior at zero as we usually do. Now we're moving into the count portion of that uh, flow chart. Now we're, the next two deal with the at-risk class, folks who are at risk for having the affair. So, Setting this mean, and this is important, guys. This is the mean for the at-risk class. The Poisson mean, and I'm looking for the right slide because I think I even wrote it down. There we go. Only this Poisson mean only applies to the at-risk class. Now, I know that I'm giving folks two opportunities to have a zero. But my only indication for being at risk for having an affair is the mean of the number of affairs for those who have had at least one. So overall in my data set, the average for the number of affairs is 1.45. But if I look at those who have had at least one, and I'm calling those at risk for having an affair, the average number of affairs for those who have had at least one jumps to 5.8. So that is what I'm centering. I'm sorry, I'm jumping around. That is what I'm centering this alpha 
mean at? The log mean count of those who are at risk for having an affair. That's 1.76. And again, I'm picking five just to show you what, what would happen. I'm gonna use centered and scaled age. And that, that's why I'm setting this mean at zero. All right, four parameters, a little bit more complex than what I have on the slide. I think you guys can handle it. So just to repeat, setting this mean at the logit of the overall proportion of zeros, setting this mean at the log mean count of those with at least one fare that I'm calling the log mean count of the at risk group, or at least the only indication I have that those folks are at risk of, for having an affair. All right, I just ran that. Here is my prior predictive simulation. Nothing that crazy. Um, here is my age, range of observed ages, uh, arbitrarily a wider range of number of affairs that I have observed. There's no reason why the count should have stopped at 12. Somebody who is really good at having affairs can have two or three affairs a month. I don't know. They're, they're really good at time management, perhaps. All right. So uh, you would have noticed I usually run this with 500. I think it gets a little too crazy with 500 because I want to show you some really interesting thing that happen, things that happen. First of all, there is this you know, concentration of lines at zero. We want that. This is a zero inflated data set. We expect that regardless of age, regardless of all the prior information I baked in, the vast majority of people are not going to cheat. The vast majority of people are going to have exactly zero affairs in a 12 month period. But look, there's something very interesting happens. There are some Poisson looking lines, but then also look at these curvilinear lines, curvilinear curves, curvilinear expressions, and they have all kinds of crazy curvature. I'm specifying two lines. And by the way, this is based on the mean count being this expression right there. One minus P, which is the probability of being in the at-risk class, times lambda, which is the mean of the at-risk class. It's like you're weight weighting the mean count by the probability of being at risk. So here I'm assigning my covariates and inverse linking them. Here I am inverse linking the other set of covariates, multiplying everything together. Uh, this should be 200, but that's fine. Notice I just have two lines. I have no squared terms in there. I have no weird exponentials, but look, I'm getting all kinds of crazy curves in there, all kinds of crazy curves. And this is, I think, demonstrating the fact that we are interacting a logist, a logit, and a uh, an exponential, and so you have something that is sigmoidal, that that can only be between zero and one, and something that is uh, has to be greater than zero at all times. So you can get some pretty weird relationships if you're not careful about how your priors are specified. Although I tried to do just lines on some scale, this is linear on the logit scale. This is linear on the log scale. Doesn't matter because um, once you interact the two, you get all kinds of weird curves in there based on how wide those priors are. So I have to restrict those hyper standard deviations quite a bit. We saw that 1.5 is a pretty good logit scale standard deviation. Let's, uh, let's just maybe take a look what happens if I just change that. So that was 0.75. I will reset it in a, in a minute. We saw 1.5 is a pretty good standard deviation um, on the logit scale. So that, you will notice that fixed some of those weird shapes uh, you know, of the relationships. These now look like Poisson curves, but it blows up too quickly to infinity. Like, 
by age 30, you're having an affair a day, man. You're, you're just Don wanting the heck out of it. And I think this is way too many affairs. The maximum observed was 12. Yeah, let's allow for 20. Why not? But I think this is still way too wide on the count scale. The zeros look fine before, honestly. So that's why I took these hyper standard deviations all the way down to 0.75 for me to, make, to be comfortable with the shapes that they produce. I don't see anything too curvy linear uh, because I tried to be linear on the logit scale and linear on the log scale. I'm also not seeing any really crazy numbers. Remember, this is per year. These are extramarital affairs. I'm assuming that the partner is at least not actively involved in helping the other person have the affairs. This better reflects the reality as represented by the data set. Remember, the data set has only six observed counts, 0, 1, 2, 3, 7, and 12. The vast majority are going to be under five. Yeah, that, that, that tracks. And a few are going to be either really successful at, at young age or really successful at old age, older age, middle age. So I am way more comfortable with these priors right here than with any of the other two that I've shown, okay? So that is how I came up with this exact set of priors. The Poisson comparison example, uh, I just tried not to change anything except for this is the log mean of all counts, not just the counts I've had at least one affair, all right? Estimate the model, everything converges, everything is beautiful. In this particular case, I, I don't have a covariate in there uh, and that's okay. First things first, note that there are fairly large differences in the parameter estimates. Uh, you know, a good example, your religiosity and marriage rating. The coefficients are far lower if we account for the zero inflation than if we don't. Finally, here is, not finally, here is the zero inflated intercept. That's the estimate of gamma zero. And we have to get used to not always looking for zero inside of that um, credible interval because that term is on the logit scale, right? That term is on the logit scale. A zero on the logit scale is 0.5. So don't go looking for zero inside there and being like, oh, uh, I, don't, I don't spot a zero in there, so uh, it's zero inflated. No, because our estimated probability of being in the immune class, that's P, right? That's low P. Let me go back. Estimated probability of being in the immune class, in my case that I just ran, is e to the 1.08 divided by one plus e to the 1.08 immune from cheating class. I can compute that e to the 1.08 divided by one plus e to the 1.08. That is 0.746. I'm predicting that 74.6% of our respondents are immune from cheating. High fives all around, okay? So be careful. Uh, you know, th that's the biggest message. We now are mixing two different GLMs together to make a really cool model that has all of these interesting features, but don't, um, you know, slow down the interpretation. And it makes a big difference. Once we correctly account for zero inflation, the coefficients change pretty dramatically. The, um, the uh, posterior predictive check, well, this is pretty darn clear, isn't it? When I ran a simple Poisson model, I observed this many zeros, but the model produced this many zeros. So I really 
missed my zeros. Now you will notice there's also lack of fit throughout. And I know there is lack of fit here too, but the lack of fit is, you know, the zeros are dead on. And yeah, there's some lack of fit there. Sure. All models are wrong, some are useful. I'm trying to find those cheaters. WAICs, my comment about comparing WAICs with um, different constants in the likelihood does hold. But I've just checked my uh, posterior predictive check and it's clear the zero inflated model fits my data be better. And there was a huge difference in the WAIC. So of course you're gonna pick the zero inflated model over the uh, Poisson model. All right, let's put some of them covariates into the model because there are some very interesting interpretations. Code is out there. You guys have just figured this out for your homework assignment about how to make sigma move around. But you will notice that these are just my priors from my prior predictive simulation. I just need to include this um, d par equals zi right in there to indicate that these priors are for the zero inflation portion of the model and the remaining priors are for the count, the at-risk portion of the model. So just checking, by the way, it's very commonplace for authors to come up with a snazzy term for the immune class and the at-risk class. So I claim the immune from cheating class are the, um, the always faithful, And the at-risk class are the cheaters. All right, that, there it is. Now, again, the cheaters can still not have an extramarital affair that year, but this model can tell you that your partner is in the cheater class. We don't observe them being a cheater, but our model thinks I can produce a probability that they are definitely a cheater versus the always faithful class. That's the structural zero, no matter how they uh, uh, rate their marriage, no matter how long they've been with the partner, no matter whether or not they have kids or not, whether they're male or not, they will not cheat. They're always faithful. So those are my two interpretations of the latent classes here. All right. Some of the in, most interesting part is to interpret these parameters. Now remember, the coefficients for the count only apply to that at-risk class. The coefficients of the count only apply to the cheater class. So this is applying only to that count model, only to the cheater class. Looks like age is not, has no significant impact on the infidelity rate on the count of extramarital affairs within the cheater class. If you are a cheater, being older or younger doesn't affect how many extramarital affairs you would have. But, but it does increase the chances of being classified as somebody who is always faithful. And it, holding all else constant, um, per standard deviation of age, we increase the odds of being classified as always faithful by E to the 0.39. So per standard deviation of age, we increase our odds of being in the always faithful class by about 48%. That's huge, 50% per standard deviation of being always faithful. Oops, too far. Well, oh, interesting. I thought I had a slide in here, but that's okay. No worries. Um, the coefficients can have opposite signs. So you will notice that these are the count coefficients that apply to that lambda. Whoops. Apply to the lambda in the at-risk class, apply to the number of extramarital affairs 
uh, given you are a cheater, these apply to the probability of being assigned to the immune class, the probability of being assigned in the always faithful class. So the um, years married. The longer we are married to our current partner, the odds of being in the always faithful class decrease. And for cheaters, the number of infidelity occasions increases significantly. Do you follow my interpretation? The count only applies to the cheater class. Let's try another one. Let's try the marriage rating. The higher we rate our marriage, the greater the odds of belonging to the always faithful class. Per standard deviation, it's e to the 0.5 greater odds of belonging to the always faithful class. And if you are a cheater, and for the cheaters, the higher they rate their marriage, the less often they do the cheating, the less often they do the deed. So very interesting way of dividing uh, human behavior, modeling human behavior. All right, let me wrap this up. It's an unholy matrimony of a count and a Bernoulli. So it makes it natural that today is the day we talk about it. Um, with great power comes great responsibility to interpret the coefficients correctly. The count coefficients apply only to the at-risk class. For us, it's the cheater class, not the whole population. In many cases, you want the whole population. Guess what? You can't get it with a zero-inflated model because the first step of a zero-inflated model is to, is to classify that observation as being either in the immune class, always faithful class, or the at-risk class, the cheater class. So there has been some work done on um, making it happen, on applying those count coefficients to the whole population. But this is pretty new, so it hasn't been incorporated into a ton of uh, standard R packages. However, if you want to code it by hand, there is now uh, a paper you can cite. Of course, we now have two separate equations. We now have two separate equations. We have one for the count given we are in the at-risk class, and we have one for the probability of being immune or at risk. So we have to make twice the decisions. Do I use exactly the same covariance? Do I uh, pick and choose the covariance? Why? Our author says, let your hypothesis drive the decision. Uh, the way I've always done it is just leave the same covariance. Who's right? I don't know. What's the science? To what end are we fitting the model? Can you do uh, some kind of a nested uh, stepwise uh, AIC-based, WAIC-based selection procedure? Yes, you will have some coding to do, but you can certainly get it done. That wraps it up. I will leave the multinomial portion for you guys to read on your own. There's only so much that is being learned by me talking at you guys. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. On Tuesday, I would like to do an activity for generalized linear models. Um, and we will move on to bigger and better things. I will try and get on that grading and no one behind. You guys have to stay safe and try to avoid them affairs. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.